My name is Nader Hagiyupur. Um, I am a, a professor of astronomy at the University of uh, uh, Hawaii and also the president of the uh, Division of Planetary Science at Hawaii U. Um, I have the pleasure of being here to uh, tell you about um, uh, planet formation. And uh, I want to start by saying that um, if I was going to give this talk yesterday, I would start by um, talking about our solar system and try to use our solar system as a, a model of planet formation that develop a model for formation of our solar system and then apply that to other planetary systems. That's what the theorists do. That the reason for it is that uh, solar system is the best system known, is the system we have known for the centuries. We have a very good knowledge of it and we have developed a lot of models for its formation. And then come uh, a lot of other uh, systems, uh, four or five thousand other planetary systems. And uh, what do we do? Uh, we are not going to go back and uh, uh, pull ourselves out and say, uh, no, I'm going to start from the beginning and I'm going to develop a, a planetary model that includes all that and explains everything. Uh, we are going to use what we have and then try to tweak it to uh, fit every one of these things. That's the, that's the general practice. But today, actually last night when I was making this talk, um, I was looking at the talk that I gave in uh, um, Vietnam and I'm like, no, I'm not going to give that. This time I'm going to do it entirely differently. I'm, I'm not going to tell you about how planets in our solar system form and how I'm going to apply that to any of those. I'm going to tell you that those are telling us that it's time for us to get away from our solar system and pay attention to them. There are 5,000 of them. Each one of them plays a different story. And it is our responsibility theories to look at them and say what are they doing and why they are there. So what I'm going to do today is that instead of solving the solar system for you, I'm going to start by this and I'm going to let physics carry us. I'm not going to talk about any model. I'm not going to promote or demote or dispute any model. I'm not going to uh, talk about any of these things that you have heard. I'm just going to let physics carry us along and see what comes out of it. And whatever comes out of it is general, can be applied to 5,000 planetary systems or can, can be applied to it. You see all these uh, pauses that I have because I was up until 5 in the morning. So please bear with me as I, <laughs> and I'm heavily jet lagged. So please bear with me as I go through this and, and I, I'm a little bit shaky. So, um, uh, oh, okay, we start with what? We start with that. We start with the molecular cloud. The molecular cloud collapses. You saw the very last slide, the previous uh, presentation. The molecular cloud collapses. There is a radiation going, uh, bipolar radiation, and then you end up with a nebula, and that nebula is uh, where planets form. That's what we all know. I'm not going to go through that. Um, but I'm going to show you this. Uh, so, so you know that uh, what I just said is not, the, um, it's just not out of my, um, my imagination. Uh, molecular clouds do collapse and stars do form and uh, <clears throat> as um, it's going to zoom in and you'll see that disks will form and everything and uh, disks um, have, a, uh, have a specific structure and that structure is what carries us through what happens to them and what are the uh, uh, next phases. The, this is one of the simu uh, simulations of stellar formation from Matthew Bate. Um, so you see uh, what is happening there. Um, I'm going to continue it. So you see what's happening there. Um, stars form, uh, disks form, stars collapse and uh, hit each other and all that. All, all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, you have disks forming around the stars and that disk has a certain structure. There is a um, bipolar outflow that clears the uh, uh, surrounding of the disk and, uh, ends and leaves you with a disk that has uh, gas and dust in it. Uh, and that gas and dust has a specific structures. Um, out here is our regions that we believe cometary objects formed. Um, closer in, with the regions that believe that the uh, terrestrial planets form and all that. But the bottom line is that you end up with, uh, after the formation of the star, after the, the collapse of the molecular cloud, you end up with a, um, with the gas, uh, with a disk of gas and dust. And if you don't believe me, there you go. That, that that's where they are. And uh, this this is the birthplace of uh, planets. Planet formation starts in this environment. After that um, uh, bipolar radiation goes away, you end up with a disk of gas and dust. And planet formation starts in this environment. But depending on where um, the depending on where you are, the physics varies. What is important to know is that 
Planet formation occurs in the midplane of this disk, and that has specific implications for a planetary system. If you see a planetary system with one planet here, one planet over there, one planet over there, those systems did not form in a disk. Those are consequence of dynamical evolution. So the last slide, the previous uh, simulation, right here had Pluto at 17 degrees. That did not form in the disk of the solar system, period, right? Because that is where planets form, and that is where they stay. If you see that one planet goes in 30 degree inclination, that is the consequence of subsequent post-formation dynamical evolution. It has nothing to do with the formation of the a planet. That's physics, and it has absolutely nothing to do with our solar system. You have a disk of gas and dust, and this disk of gas and dust behaves in a certain way. The dust molecules are subject, constantly subject to being bombarded by um, sorry, the dust particles constantly subject to being bombarded by gas molecules. And that um, has a consequence. The consequence of it is that the onset of planet formation, that, that is the coalescence of dust particles and the growth to larger bodies, is a natural and inevitable consequence of the formation of the nebula. If you have a gas and dust, I will show you why. If you have a system of gas and dust, dust particles will come close to each other, will sit next to each other, and will grow. There is no question about it. So if you say that if that's, that's what it is, every system must have a planetary system. The story of planetary system is not um, how that's, the story of planetary system is not that dust coagulation. The story is that whether that process can succeed um, to form a complete planetary system, can continue successfully to form a planetary system. And that has to do with the environment where it is. If you have your disk in an environment where it's subject to many perturbations, you may actually be able to grow dust particles, but you may not be able to form planetary systems. Or if you have an environment that the uh, objects grow to a certain size, you may have a bunch of protoplanets going around, but they never succeed to form planets. This, the, this is inevitable. Whether this becomes planetary system is a different story. And that's what I want to carry you along again, to see what is the physics of different, different parts of it. The first part of the physics comes from here. What you see here is um, the stopping time on vertical axis in terms of the distance um, uh, in the disk. So what does it say? This corresponds to um, radii and the size of different objects. <clears throat> what it says is the following. Take an object of any of that size, and only that object, put it in a disk of gas that is rotating around your central star, and nothing else, and give it a flick. That object starts by going on Keplerian um, orbit, and that is the Keplerian time over there. This says how long you will take for it to stop in independent motion and start going with the gas. So you see that for a micrometer object, the time is very, very short. That's the time. The time is very short. But as the object grows, it shows its independent motion, and the time of interacting or getting affected by gas becomes smaller and smaller. If you have a kilometer size, it takes a long time for gas to actually stop it and do something with it. So this tells you something very, very important. If you have a dust particle in there, the dynamics of the dust particle is heavily dictated by the dynamics of the gas. Basically, dust particles don't behave on their own. There are three ways that dust particles move in a gas. If they, depending on their sizes, if their size is between 1 to 100 micrometers, the Brownian motion uh, kicks in. The Brownian motion, you're all familiar with it. Uh, drop, a, a drop of ink in a, in a glass of water, come back tomorrow, and the wa uh, water is all, has the uh, color of the ink. That's the Brownian motion. And the differential drift is, uh, depending on the size of the object, the object moves because um, it is a solid body as opposed to gas particles. The gas molecules. And the turbulence. Uh, the turbulence affects the different size of the body. Uh, I'll explain uh, in a uh, simulation that how this uh, turbulence causes objects of different sizes to be separated from one another. But these are the ways that dust particles behave in a gas depending on how gas um, dictates it, how gas tells them what to do. Now, what is interesting is that regardless of this, when two dust particles, when dust particles are in a gas, like, as I said, their motion is heavily dictated by the gas. You give them a flick, quickly they lose their independence and they start rotating with the gas. However, there is a difference between gas motion and solid motion. Gas motion is uh, dictated by the internal temperature and the uh, pressure 
uh, properties of the gas, whereas the solid motion is dictated by the gravity of the central star. So although your dust particles are heavily perturbed by the gas, and they're dictated what to the, the gas tell them what to do, because of the gravity of central star, they have slightly, very slightly different motion. Two dust particles, they gently move in a gas medium, and when they come very close to each other, the molecular forces kick in and hold them next to each other. And that those two form a bigger, slightly bigger object, moves a little bit faster, and once it catches another dust particle, they come to each other and they've they sit next to each other because of the molecular forces. And that way you start from two dust particles, you form a little bit bigger one, a little bit bigger one, a little bit bigger one, and eventually you form an array of dust particles that they are aggregates, they are fluffy aggregates, they are just sitting next to each other simply because of molecular forces. This is not just that, th this is what you see in the uh, ex um, experiment as well. <coughs> Our colleagues uh, in Germany, uh, Jürgen Blum and uh, uh, his lab, do this on a regular basis. And what you see here is that uh, a, um, a bunch of uh, silicon clay uh, put in, in a, a solution and letting them interact with one another and they form this fractal type of objects. We're talking about very, very, very small dust particles, uh, mic micron size, and even when they come next to each other, their sizes become 10 micron size, or 50 micron size, or higher micron size. They're still, these fluffy aggregates, these fractals, are still very, very small. And, and because they are small, they still gently move, and when they hit each other, they merge. Depending on whether they move fast or they move slowly, and depending on how um, the impact velocity is, they either just come sit next to each other, or they, they, uh, they uh, hit each other and they just go away. They um, destroy each other. And then the next step is that, um, I can just show it with my hand, they just come uh, hit each other and uh, some of them roll into one another. This process of rolling, hitting, and destroying, and rolling again, this continues until you get objects of about a few millimeter. This comes right out of physics. We can actually write the equations for it, solve it analytically, and that uh, we can do it in the laboratory. This is, has nothing to do with simulations. This is real, real physics. You start from a micron size, and you let gas carry you, and you uh, naturally form millimeter size objects. So what happens next? Now you have started from small size, you grew to a little bit bigger size, and that object now shows its independent motion, goes a little bit faster. The time for its stopping, the time for being affected by gas, uh, extends, becomes larger. So what, what happens now is that because the object has, uh, you rolled it and it became compact. Now the object has compactified, it's become really, really hard. When it goes around it no long, and, it, and it goes faster, it's no longer when it sees another object of its own, it's no longer molecular forces that keep it uh, next to each other. When they go around, they bang into each other. And that starts happening from about the millimeter, millimeter size or about, about half of centimeter size. And that causes problems. The problem is that when you do the similar type of experiment and you let objects of half a centimeter or centimeter size hit each other, they don't stick to one another. They actually break each other. They move so fast that when they see each other and they hit, they break. What you see here is um, <coughs> the radii of two objects hitting each other with different velocities. The color coding indicates whether uh, these two objects will stick to one another or not and what happens to them. Um, red means fragmentation and uh, um, uh, orange means cratering and erosion and uh, um, green means uh, sticking. So if you have uh, um, the unit is centimeters, so if you have objects of uh, about a percent of centimeter or smaller, when they see each other, the molecular forces kick in and hold them next to each other. So the sticking is actually um, okay; it works out. But as the, any of, uh, of the objects they grow in mass, when they become get to larger region of the parameter space, they become sizes become larger. When they hit each other, then this the, the erosion and fragmentation kick into place. So. You ask yourself, um, physics dictates how things go, and that physics grow things for you to about a centimeter size, but then the same physics fails you. And then past centimeter size, you cannot continue. So how did planets form? And the problem is that it doesn't even 
end here, it becomes even more complicated. Now what you see is the same interaction of gas, solid with gas, except that what I'm showing here is the relative velocity <coughs> with respect to gas for an object in terms of its size. This is the size of the object, and that is its velocity relative to gas. Um, as an object grows, its interaction with the gas and the type of the gas track changes. So you start from one regime and you go to another regime as the, as the size of the object grows. And then once you do that type of simulations, um, you, you'll see that um, objects of about meter size don't respond to gas drag well. As a matter of fact, gas drag, instead of taking energy out of them, causes them to migrate toward the central star and get dumped into the central star. So what is the problem? The problem is that you start from centimeter size, you grow them to, sorry, you start from micron size, you grow them to centimeter size, and they don't stick anymore. They stop right there. Even if you could grow them larger to meter size, then they wouldn't stay around for you to form planets. They get dumped into the central star. So you ask yourself, how did planets form? Well, <clears throat> this, um, this, I put this slide in just to, as a summary of what I just explained, that depending on which part of this uh, nebula you are, you may have drift towards the central star. You may have uh, um, coagulation to the larger bodies. You will have uh, a settling on the mid-plane because planets form on the mid-planes and all that. It basically summarizes what I just explained. So how did centimeter sized bodies grow to um, larger sizes? I'm going to be very, very, very honest with you. This is honest to God answer. We don't know. <laughs> Seriously, we do not know. You may have heard of all these fancy models and everything. Every single one of those models comes with assumptions. Every one of, single one of those models comes with simulations that are limited to computer capabilities and all that. And at the end of the day, you, you may have a model that can explain things for you at that region of the disk, but it may not be able to explain everything within the context of the solar system. So, there are models out there. I'm not, I said that I'm not going to talk about any model. There are models out there, and the, you can study them as much as you want. But the, at the end of the day, we really don't know how this growth happens. One thing that I can tell you is that, in my opinion, um, nature has the tendency of, t of identifying the most logical and physically val valid way and take that route. So if we are going to model, um, uh, we better not make it too complicated. Uh, the complicated models are really, really nice. They, they, they do a beautiful job on our computer, um, but they do a beautiful job on a computer. And, and in the reality, um, out there, um, complicated models um, don't last. Simple as that. Um, nature is not going to do it the way that we do it. Nature is not going to solve all those fancy equations. Find the way to, to go. One thing that I can tell you for sure is that when the disk is, um, is there, the disk evolves into become turbulent. So this, this turbulences and the places where this uh, turbulence happens um, may help bringing objects together and uh, um, facilitate their growth to larger bodies. And that is because of a very nice physics that occurs when this type of things appear in a, in a disk. So the turbulence causes, the, uh, causes that in some regions of the disk, uh, the density of the gas uh, is locally enhanced, or pressure of the gas is locally enhanced. And that results into a very nice physics things. So what I'm showing you here uh, is um, what I made of gas, and uh, um, I made the density of the gas at this ring to be a, a little bit um, uh, more than its surrounding area. The gas also has dust particles in it, or solid objects in it. Solid objects are subject to gas drag, and also they're subject to the gravity of the central star. Gas itself is subject to internal pressure, and because of its internal pressure, it kicks expands until the gravity of the central star and internal pressure they counter each other and then the gas reached the equilibrium static equilibrium right at that stage <clears throat> the equation of the gas is given by this its rotation is because of the gravity of the central star and because of the of its pressure the pressure and gravity 
counter each other, and then gas reaches equilibrium, and it starts rotating. For the particle, however, you don't have um, pressure. You only see the gravity of the central star. So the particle goes on Keplerian motion. That causes something very interesting. If, the, if a particle is out here, outside of a pressure bump, or a density in homogeneity, or a density accumulation, the gas density accumulation, when the particle is here, then what happens is that when it's moving, the gas going, is going slower. You know, when you're outside, um, outside of the pressure bump, this is high school algebra, that derivative is negative, right? And because that derivative is negative, if you are going Keplerian, gas is going to go slower. So the solid object goes Keplerian, gas is going slower, it's going to prevent the solid object to go fast, and what happens is that the solid object loses energy and momentum and the spirals inward. Inside of that, this density, what happens is that um, that, that uh, derivative becomes positive. So when it is positive, object, the gas molecules that is inside goes faster. So if you are a particle and you are going around the star with the Keplerian, gas is pushing you from behind. So you gain energy, you gain angular momentum, and you spiral out. So if there is, even if momentarily, even if it's for a short time, there is some sort of pressure bump or some sort of density enhancement in a gas, that density enhancement, for as long as it lives, it brings solid objects together. That may facilitate the growth of bodies to a larger um, size, but it all depends on its lifetime, it all depends how long it stays around and how strong that is. When it happens in density enhancements around here and it accumulates bodies, now your accumulated object, its collective behavior is larger than centimeter size and it moves faster. So now you have sort of um, you can say that you have sort of overcome that centimeter size collision barrier, but now you have a, a bigger object that is moving, and if it hits another bigger object, it may coalesce with it or may break it apart. But what I want you to take from this is that this type of behavior that happens in a disk and is because of the evolution of the disk may enhance or facilitate uh, the bringing of objects together. But at the end of the day, uh, we don't know how objects grow from centimeter size to kilometer size. But what we know is that disks of kilometer size exist. You all have seen images of debris disks. They are there. Debris disks um, that are a result of collision of bodies, uh, uh, they're there, they exist. They, they prove that objects do grow from centimeter size to kilometer size, half a kilometer. Uh, and uh, um, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to continue from there. So. I'm not going to talk about how these objects grow because then I will be talking about the specific models and I promise that I'm not going to talk about models, but I want to talk about the physics. We uh, know that the physics can carry us from dust to centimeter size, but we don't know what happens next. But what we do know is that if we have a disk of kilometer size bodies and a bunch of other objects, gravity will kick in. Remember this. Now what happens is that when you go from this regime, to regime of kilometer size, then the effect of gas is much smaller. Gravity is the dominant effect, and that gravity causes objects to interact with each other through mutual gravitation, right? And that we know how to do. We know it, we know force equals mass time acceleration, force is force of gravity, we can solve that equation. So the rest of it comes out of physics and algebra. <clears throat> Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, explain a few things uh, that we do in celestial mechanics and then um, I'll tell you, with that explanation, i tell you uh, how we go from here to uh, we grow, ob objects grow and become bigger and bigger. Take one of these uh, bodies, for instance, take this one. <clears throat> so this object, um, has, this object has its own gravity, right? We define a, a sphere around it. Um, we don't define. There is a sphere around it that any object within that sphere, it will feel the gravity of this body. Their motion is basically dominated by gravity of this body and everything else, including the central star, will be perturbation. For objects outside, the central star is the main force of gravity and that is a perturbation. This region around that object is called Hill's sphere. And it comes from uh, a simple formula. It has to do with the mass of the object, with the mass of the star, and the semi-major axis of the orbit of the object. So anything inside this radius, 
will be dominated by gravity of the object, right? So if you have a bunch of smaller bodies here, the gravity will attract those toward them because the rest of the world is just, um, is just perturbation. The gravity of this body will start attracting them. They come rapidly, they come towards this, that little uh, kilometer size object and they stick to it and the mass becomes bigger and once this mass becomes bigger, that radius becomes bigger, it encompasses more material and the more material gets attracted to now a slightly larger body and get, stick to it and the mass becomes bigger and the radius becomes bigger and attract more material and this whole thing goes through what is called runaway growth. You start from a kilometer sized bodies and by simple gravity your object in a very short time grows to become bigger and bigger and bigger. As this goes through, as this process goes through, the objects around, um, same thing happens to this one, same thing happens to that one, objects around get absorbed by um, other bodies and eventually you end up with a bunch of bigger objects that have swept up the surrounding area and they became bigger and bigger. Now something interesting happens to them and now and remember, we are at the regime that gravity kicks in. So these big objects, they interact with each other through gravity. And uh, <clears throat> they go around, they hit each other, um, they are moving really fast, they hit each other, they break each other into pieces. Again, they sweep each other through the process that I just explained. They grow, they hit each other into pieces, and this process constantly continues um, until, you, um, until bigger objects are formed. You will have a disk of big moon to Mars sized planetary embryos, kilometer sized bodies, dust, gas, and now you have a soup of the material which its, its dynamics is primarily dominated by the center of the star and the gravitational force of these big objects that form through the runaway growth. So, so far we are good. Now let's see what, what happens when this process that I just explained occurs at different parts of the disk. I'm showing this cartoon. On one side I'm showing the uh, change in the temperature of the disk. I'm, on the other side I'm showing the type of the material that may grow in that object, uh, in that disk. Okay, so let's for a moment focus in the region where the material, uh, the, the disk contains ice. So as you go farther away from the center of the star, the amount of ice that originally existed in the disk stay. You can define a region that is called the snow line and then past that the disk basically maintains uh, its uh, ice. Now before I continue I want to say something about the snow line. Um, we all talk about the snow line but I want to make it a little bit precise so we know what, what actually it is. The snow line is a place where in a, ga in a gaseous disk, in a nebula, the, the dust particles manage to maintain molecules of water on their surfaces permanently. If you have a fully formed planetary system, there is no snow line. You can define a region beyond which the life of lifetime of the ice changes by the distance. You can define ice longevity region, but there is no snow line. Our solar system does not have a snow line. We have water here, right? But right past us, past Mars, all those asteroids, many of them, are dry. So how do you define that? In a fully formed system, we define ice longevity system, ice longevity model. You can say that depending on where the object is, it can maintain its ice for a certain amount of time. There are models for that, and they work perfectly. When you are dealing with a nebula, you can define a snow line. You can say that past that region, the dust grains can maintain ice and water molecules on the surface permanently. So if that's the case, you are dealing with, if you are dealing with objects here, if this process of uh, growth and <coughs> runaway growth happens down up here, something interesting occurs. So here your objects are primarily, um, ca carry primarily ice. Remember this whole uh, formation, let me go back here quickly, this, this whole thing is local. You are here and you absorb whatever is in your surrounding. When you are here, you are not absorbing anything back here, right? Because it is local, so if this happens back here, most of the material that goes into that object is ice. So now you're dealing with a bunch of objects that have dirt and ice to them and they go around and as they go around, when they hit each other, they stick better. So bodies containing ice stick more efficiently and as a result when they stick, um, 
they grow better, they grow more efficiently. Right. <clears throat> so um, as a result, the runaway growth produces large bodies in the part of the uh, protoplanetary states in a, in a short time. So when you're out, of, out here, when your objects have ice in them, you stick better and you grow them better, or they do, they grow better. And, they, and uh, what happens is that you form a bunch of um, big, large bodies, larger than those planetary embryos, in a very short time. Right? Now, when that occurs, uh, three things can follow. The first thing is that <clears throat> those bodies that are growing, those planetary embryos that are growing to become, uh, say, moon Mars size, 10 Mars size, uh, half of Earth and all that, they interact with each other, they throw each other out, or you end up with a, with a disk that has a bunch of small, small bodies and everything. Um, some of the Kepler uh, systems are like that. And, uh, or no planet, no planet uh, formation occurs. Simple as that. You know, your, your disk uh, just forms the small bodies and everything goes away. The other um, possibility is that a body, one body or two, they become large enough to attract gas from the surrounding. So they grow, the system um, allows one or two or three of them become so large that the, as they're growing, they start attracting gas from the surrounding. So I'm going to show this, um, but don't read much to it. I'm just using it as a cartoon. So you have your object um, sitting out there and it has grown enough to start attracting gas. So it goes through the similar process of runaway growth. Uh, the object attracts gas and as it attracts gas, it has more gravity, attracts more gas, attracts more gas and it goes through a huge process and attracts a tremendous amount of gas from its surrounding and sweeps up all the material in its path. Now the gas becomes so heavy that it cannot stand its own gravity, it collapses and it collapses, stops until the gas reaches equilibrium. That is when you have a gas giant planet. That's what it says here. Your solid material in the disk grows until the point that it, can, it has enough gravity to start attracting gas. And it starts attracting gas without its solid, solid growth changes. And then the gas accretion becomes rapid, goes through a runaway growth, and then the gas collapses and you get your um, giant planet. <clears throat> Notice that I didn't mention any model. Notice that I didn't put any time scale on it. This is just, this comes out of physics, assuming or provided the disk allow that to happen. If the disk does not stay around long enough, if the gas does not stay around long enough, and if the next, the third thing happen, you will not have that. And the third thing that can happen is that as that object starts growing, as the solid growth at this region is happening, uh, the gas is still there. And that gas can apply a torque to the object. Um, the part of the disk of the gas that is interior to the object wants to pull it this way and the part that is outside wants to pull it that way. Depending on which one of them wins, the object may move. That motion, that migration may happen during the formation or may happen after the body formed uh, depends on the characteristic of the gas and the disk. And what happens is that you will have planet migration. And that explains all these hot Jupiters and uh, uh, warm Neptunes and all that you have. You have they form. They have no choice but to form in the outer part. That is the part that physically allows and uh, facilitates growth to larger bodies. But then, because of the in subsequent interaction with the disk, they have no choice but to migrate. So they migrate. They either migrate by opening a gap, or they migrate as they are growing, depending on the type of the um, type of their system. So. You may ask that, okay, if this is the case, every giant planet has to migrate. Why didn't our solar system migrate? So before you bombard me with all that question, here we go. Planet formation is a stochastic process, period. It's a stochastic. There is nothing we can do about it. And that means it is not possible to regulate it, nor is it possible to make predictions about it. We may make a model, but we are making a model in our, sol in our computer Assuming that nothing else exists except for our model. In reality, a molecular gas that collapses is subject to a lot of perturbation from the rest of the universe, from the rest of the galaxy. Who knows what happens to it? We don't know the initial conditions of any of our planetary systems, and we don't know the dynamical history. We just model them in our computer, assuming that our system is only that and nothing else exists in the universe. So you see how limited those models are? 
I've been doing that for 25 years. I can see, uh, I can say that, you know. Um, I can say that what we are doing is limited. What we are doing has a lot of uh, shortcomings in it. But I want you to also s uh, see that um, what, what these shortcomings are, and of course, some of it comes because our hands are tied, you know. And we are limited with our computer uh, capabilities. But at the end of the day, we know that even though we model planet formation, we know that it is not possible to regulate it and it's not possible to make predictions. So you ask, you know, what's the point of doing all this? Well, the point is the following. Do a lot of it and identify the physics that is most dominant. We do a lot of planet formation models with different type of physics, and we do statistical analysis to see which one of those physics processes is the most dominant, and in what system. So, so far, I've been trying to familiarize you with the different physics that kicks in from the beginning, and I'm carrying you all the way to what, what, what happens when Earth is formed and all. So you see the different uh, physics processes that come in, but at the end of the day, what we do is that we take, we take our computers, we see how much we can do with it, and we start doing that, we, we start doing the, uh, uh, phys putting physics in our models, and we run simulations after simulations, and we run 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 simulations, and we study them uh, statistically, that the statistical analysis tell us that, yes, um, if your gas stays around, there is a very good chance that your system will actually make giant planets, despite the fact that observations say giant planets are rare. Right? So, it, um, uh, you see what I'm, what I'm trying to get at? I, I think I keep repeating myself. So, <laughs> so, let's go back here. I explained what's going on back here. Okay, now I want to explain what's going on there. What if this whole process of runaway growth happens there? Uh, in a region of the disk where the disk has already lost its, uh, its water because it's close to the central star and the um, building blocks of planets are dry. What happens there? Well, in the inner part, planetesimal dry and they rotate rapidly and as a result, they collide and they shatter and fragment each other. So, they move very rapidly, they're, they're a bunch of rocks, they run into each other, they shatter each other, and they break each other into pieces. So you ask, um, why do we have Earth? And uh, why do we have terrestrial planets and all that? Well, <coughs> um, let me explain uh, uh, that in a, in a, see if I can use that uh, simulation to explain this. Okay, so what you see here what we use to explain terrestrial planet formation in a very simple way without doing much of modeling. So you see the green and the blue dots. The green dots are the uh, products of that runaway growth that resulted into planetary embryos to moon and Mars sized bodies. And um, the Blue ones are those kilometer-sized planetesimals that, that, are, uh, that are there because these bodies hit each other, they break each other into pieces, and or, and or they did not form planetary bodies. Remember, I, as I was talking about this uh, the runaway growth, I said that you end up with a disk of moon to Mars-sized bodies, kilometer-sized object, dust, gas, it is all there. And that, that rest of it is represented by those kilometer-sized bodies. We put them over there. We let all these three, four thousand objects interact with each other through gravity. And we literally solve F equal MA for all of them. We don't force them, we just put 5,000 equations over there and we say to computer, solve this, right? So if you have a good um, the com uh, computer code to do that for you, um, then if you say to, you'd say to your computer one other thing, that when the objects hit each other, how to treat them? So that I will explain. That is one of the limitations that we have because of our computer um, capabilities. Um, depending on how you define when objects hit each other, you can go from one time to another time to another time and integrate your system forward and eventually you end up with um, a planetary system. So you let objects hit each other and uh, they, they interact with one another, they interact with those uh, planets. Well, everything is gravity. right? Everything is G mm prime over r squared, you know, simple um, physics 101. And uh, you end up with some assembly of planets. <clears throat> now, see what I wrote over there. 
if giant planets in the outer part of the disk do not undergo major migration, collision among planetism or some planetary embryos may result in formation of terrestrial planets. And I uh, bold may and terrestrial planets uh, because depending on the terrestrial planet formation or any, any planet formation is stochastic, in, this may not produce anything. Or it may produce one or two or five or ten uh, objects of different sizes. But it doesn't mean that if you put that over there you will always get something like this. It's a stochastic and you may not get anything at all. But I also wanted to mention major migration. If the planet, if the giant planet, as it is forming, migrates, then it affects whatever is in front of it. And that effect, uh, depending on the rate of the migration, depending on the size of the giant planet, that the perturbation that is imposed to the material in front of it uh, will cause different type of systems. For instance, um, your giant planet can migrate and become a hot Jupiter, or if the disk goes away at a certain point and it stops, it can produce super Earth, or it can produce, uh, come close and it can produce some terrestrial planets, produce variety of things depending on how it migrates, how large or small that is. So once again, um, stochastic. Stochasticity is the, is the name of the game, and um, you can see it depending on your system, you get different results. So. This, despite that the fact that it's stochastic, despite the fact that you can't use it to make predictions, something interesting comes out of it. And that's what this is, this is what, um, um, this is what the slide is about. We made this slide assuming that Jupiter and Saturn are in their current orbits. And uh, actually, Andre, sitting all the way back, was kind enough to make this slide. So um, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are sitting on their current orbits, and we put, um, this bunch of planetary embryos and all that in, uh, in the inner part of the solar system and we let them interact with the star, with Jupiter and Saturn and with one another. And this is one snapshot after one million years. So let me explain to you what this is. These lines that you see here, this correspond to mean motion resonances with Jupiter. Any object that gets to this line, its orbit will be half orbit of Jupiter. Or when it gets here, the ratio of Jupiter, or orbit of Jupiter, uh, orbital period of Jupiter to orbital period of this object is seven to four. It gets to mean motion resonance with Jupiter. This thing that you see here, and we show by nu six, is the perturbative effect of Saturn. Is a secular is because of secular effect of Saturn, and the same thing down here, nu five, is because of secular effect of uh, uh, Jupiter. What does the secular effect means? In a very very short, um, um, you know, sentence, um, as uh, Jupiter and Saturn rotate, the um, the variation of the orbit imposes um, perturbations on the variation of orbital asteroids, and that causes some of the asteroids to gain high eccentricities. What you see here is eccentricity of the asteroid in terms of the distance. Okay, this is a snapshot of the interaction of a disk of planetary, protoplanetary objects and asteroids with Jupiter Saturn sitting there in their orbit. This is the signature of those objects. If your disk, if your system, if your final planetary system carries the signature of the perturbation of giant planets, that tells you where giant planets are, that tells you where giant planets were at the time of the formation of the system, right? Now let's look at our solar system. This is Kirkwood gaps in our solar system. What you see here uh, is uh, <clears throat> the number of asteroids in terms of their distances, uh, in terms of their semi-major axis, and there are gaps. Um, this is the bird eye view. There are gaps in the asteroid belt, and those correspond to mean motion resonances with Jupiter. And these are the effects of uh, um, secular resonances of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, for instance, Saturn causes the inclinations to be below 20 degrees and uh, um, not to exceed 32 degrees uh, inclination of asteroids. You see this. And as I mentioned, when I was explaining the uh, formation of objects in the outer part and inner part, the outer part formation is much more efficient and happens more quickly. This shows our solar system when it formed, Jupiter and Saturn were they, where they are now and affected the formation of terrestrial planets. So you may not like that um, and you might have seen many uh, models that uh, move Saturn and Jupiter and on and all that. At the end of the day, before terrestrial planet formation is complete, your Jupiter and Saturn 
have to go back to where they are now to produce asteroid belt and to produce uh, the secular and uh, uh, secular effect that we see. Asteroid belt is the evidence, carries the signature of where Jupiter and Saturn were at the time of the formation of terrestrial planets. So no matter what type of model you develop for the formation of solar system, your terrestrial planet formation is heavily affected by the fact that Jupiter and Saturn were where they were, where they are now at the time of the formation. So this has a very important consequence. Accretion is local and, uh, yeah, and objects form from whatever is their surrounding. Remember the slides from the runaway growth and everything. So if that is the case, and if Jupiter and Saturn were sitting over there when terrestrial planets form, Earth formed in a region of the protoplanetary disk where originally there was no water. This is a cartoon, Earth warm around here, right? And that region was originally dry. And accretion is local, Earth formed from dry material, so where did the water come from? Okay. And that all has to do with uh, the evolution of our solar system, the, the formation of the giant planets, and all that. So let's go back to here. <clears throat> you look at your disk and say, Earth formed in a dry region, and this disk shows that the reservoir of ice is back here. So is it possible that icy objects from the outer regions somehow found their way to Earth and they got added to the surface of the Earth after Earth was fully formed and that way water was delivered? Well, if you do the math, um, the answer is uh, not enough of it will come in. Um, uh, there, there are different models for the amount of um, water that is on and inside Earth, and uh, if you take that into account and do the math and the number of objects that can come from the farther out to the region of Earth, um, you see that at best you can bring in 10% of the water. You still need to account for about 85-90% uh, of it in some other way. So can this happen? In reality, yes, but it doesn't bring enough of it. So the, you ask yourself, what happens next? So, this is the idea where objects like comets, planetesimals from further regions, did they bring water in and add it as a veneer to the surface of Earth? Well, the problem with it is that they might have, except that when you look at the, at the chemical properties, they may not agree with the chemical properties of the current uh, ocean water. Um, this shows the D2H ratios for different comets and also the D2H ratio for Earth water, uh, protosolar um, nebula, and uh, also for uh, the next table also for meteorites. So you see that uh, those comets that could have come around uh, Earth and be close to Earth, um, their D2H ratio uh, doesn't match that of Earth. And this table shows that as well. I'm going to just um, box this so you see that the nebula and carbonaceous chondrites and Earth, um, they are, the carbonaceous chondrites and Earth are close. Nebula is much smaller and uh, uh, they're different from comets as well. So um, you ask yourself, where, the water um, come, where, where did the water come from and uh, why is it that this whole thing doesn't work? Well, before I get into the next phase, I must mention that I, I said here the argument for Comets not being the main major source of water is that the D2H ratio doesn't match the D2H ratio of the current ocean water. Uh, but we have to take that with a huge amount of caution. The current water that we have is not primordial water. The current mo uh, water on an ocean has been uh, diluted, has been uh, polluted by Earth, by, by life. And life and biology and all that uh, has created a D2H ratio that may not be the true representative of what it must have been at the time of the formation. So while this argument is still being used, um, but if you're going to use it, just keep in back of your uh, head that um, um, the current D2H ratio of the earth water may not be the true representative of what it was um, at the time that it was primordial. But my argument for that is always this, that if you do the math, if you do the dynamics, if you actually do uh, uh, encountering of comets with the inner part of the solar system and count them, uh, you, you won't be able to bring enough of it. <clears throat> okay, so what happens and why is it that uh, uh, Earth has water? So go back again, let's go back again here. This is where water is. 
But the, um, what I try to explain is that whether the water can come all the way from this region to the dry region. However, as you go farther away, you, the amount of water may actually maintain in, the, in asteroids in the region close to the terrestrial planet formation and uh, that may affect the delivery of water to Earth rather than bringing something all the way from back here. What I'm trying to say is that maybe the answer to the question is not here. Maybe the answer to the question is around here. Maybe the answer to the question is in the fact that after planet formation and, uh, and kilometer-sized objects are formed, during their formation, they trap some water in them, and that water stayed in them despite the fact that they are in asteroid belt, despite the fact that they are close to the star, the water inside uh, stayed in them, and that water contributed to the formation of Earth during its formation and not necessarily after it was fully formed. This is what this type of simulation tells you. This is the same thing that I showed in previous slide. Now what I'm doing is that <clears throat> I'm assigning some water to, one of, uh, to all those asteroids and embryos and uh, I'm decreasing, increasing the amount of water as the object goes away uh, because you go farther away, the disk becomes cooler so presumably your asteroid, your embryo might have been able to uh, retain more water. And now we let them in, go through the same type of interaction and uh, the, the gravity kicks in and <clears throat> what we see is the following. And I, I really want your uh, attention here. What we see is the following. We see that objects from here, especially large planetary embryos, they hit each other and during the collision some of their contents, some of their volatiles, including ice, gets transferred to another body. And then they hit another one and some of them gets transferred to another one. This transfer of water, transfer of volatiles, we see them happening through successive collisions until objects that are here receive some of that water. You start with a lot of water back there, you receive a tiny amount of it, but that is all right because water, the water content of Earth is only 0.1%. It's around this amount. So you don't need to bring in much. And this successive collision, even though some of the water is lost during this collision, helps you to bring, to transport water from one, per, one place to another, and that way you can, you can uh, account for the water inside there. So the idea behind it is that the water was not delivered and was not distributed on the surface. The water came through successive collisions and was transferred from one object to the other and eventually was incorporated to the formation of Earth and Earth formed all this from these objects that had some water in them. <clears throat> and that way we believe that the water... So water, another thing, water was not delivered by embryos here getting tossed into that region. It was through successive collision and I, and I want to emphasize that because um, uh, there, there are several points that I want to make before I finish my talk. I'm going to show you one of those simulations so I can rest my throat as we uh, do this. So um, Jupiter and Saturn are, are sitting somewhere here and, uh, and uh, uh, the disk uh, objects interact with, with each other. Um, you see the, uh, <coughs> the effect of mean motion resonances. You also see, let me quickly stop it here. You see that effect of new six of Saturn, you see the new five of Jupiter, you see the effect of um, mean motion resonances and all. And uh, I deliberately, again, thanks to Andre sitting back there for making these movies, I deliberately chose one that does not give you solar system, just to tell you that these simulations are stochastic. So not just because I started with some initial condition, I should get solar system, not necessarily. Now, for um, about 20, 25 years, I've been showing these movies and I've been saying that this is how solar system, uh, terrestrial planets form, and this is how water comes about. Uh, we also went further to say that, um, to say that this whole process has one issue. When we use this process to explain uh, formation of our solar system, we get Earth, we get Venus comes as a bonus, we get some asteroids, but Mars is large. We have been saying that um, for um, 25 years, that these models of terrestrial planet formation, they give you, uh, they explain how Mars, uh, 
Earth and Venus are formed, but they can't explain the small mass of Mars. Mars is too massive. We even went ahead and made theories for them. So this is a theory. Um, uh, this is the Grand Tech model, uh, World Shuttle 2011, and uh, Andre and I and uh, Oton, uh, we developed uh, this theory, the partial gap model. And uh, we, we were able to explain that, yes, if, if the disk had non-homogeneity in it, depending on how those, no, uh, those non-homogeneity were distributed, where they were, you may be able to get a solar system that has a small Mars. We even went ahead and said that. But we never told you one thing. These simulations are not quantitative. And what does that mean? It means that we are using them to explain formation of our solar system, but these simulations have some internal shortcomings that does not allow them to be quantitative and therefore cannot be used to determine how much water was delivered to Earth and whether Mars is truly massive or not. And the reason for it is a, a variety of different things. So there are merely, these simulations are not quantitative, they are merely for the proof of concepts. You should you'd use these simulations to identify the most effective physics because your computational um, uh, facilities are limited. So you can't do everything at all times. You have to identify the most effective physics and use that as your primary source to continue. Um, so these, you run several hundred, several thousand of these. You analyze them statistically, and that tells you that the four or five pieces of physics are more important, and those two, you can ignore them safely. One of the biggest issues with these models is the following. Remember when, um, at the beginning of my talk, I said when objects come close, depending on the, how you define the hits, right? Now here's the thing. The many of these simulations, not all of them, many of these simulations suffer from the following flaw or, or shortcoming. When objects come close, and uh, if they hit each other, they break each other into pieces, and all of a sudden, in the first step of your integration, yeah, from 5,000 objects that you start with, you end up with them about a million debris, right? The speed of this type of simulation goes with the number of objects squared. So in the first step of integration, you produce so many debris, so much debris, so many objects that your integration halts and you cannot continue. And all you are doing is just solving F equal MA. You cannot continue, right? To overcome that problem, what this simula some of these simulations do is that they define a the critical distance. They said if the objects come, two objects come closer than that critical distance, consider them fully merged, add their masses together, add their volatile contents together without any loss of mass, without any frag uh, uh, fragmentation, and without any loss of volatiles. So, you take two objects, you add them together, you use simple conservation of mass and momentum, and you continue. This way, you reduce the number of the objects through the collision, and you allow your simulations to continue. Except that, uh, so as you can imagine, um, I'm going to run this for you. This is what happens uh, when the objects actually hit each other. You know, they break each other into pieces and all, and uh, <coughs> they, they produce a lot of debris. A quantitative model has to be able to model collisions and transport and transfer of volatiles correctly. So if you want to be able to do planet formation and understand how planet formation gets into other, uh, what, what is the physics behind it and how it can explain formation of other planetary systems, we have to do collisions and we have to do transport and transfer of water correctly. Okay, so now, as I just explained to you, this simulation that you saw, that objects hit each other, these are SPA simulations. They produce a ton of bodies. You have no choice but to use SPA simulations to re and model collisions realistically, but as you notice, they produce so much, so much small objects that your integration halts right there. You start with a bunch of bodies and you let all of them hit each other and you treat all collisions through SPA simulations and boom, you produce billions of objects and your uh, integration uh, um, halts and you can't proceed. So what do you do? A quantitative model of terrestrial planet formation has to be able to model collision and transport and transfer of volatiles realistically. There are codes that they do that, and they do that by considering certain, by making certain assumptions. 
There are codes that include fragmentation based on a preset prescription. They say that I consider two objects hitting each other depending on their masses and their relative velocities. When they hit, I break them into five pieces, ten pieces. They introduce some prescription. They work perfectly. There's nothing wrong with them. Some of them use collision catalogs. They say that two objects come, I look at a catalog, a preset catalog, and that catalog says, if the masses are that and the relative velocities are that, take three fragments, each one of them with such and such mass and relative velocity. They're good as well. So you can use those to do the realistic collision, except that all current models consider no loss of volatiles during the transport and transfer of um, bodies. So they do it, they do the collisions, but they work very well for the mass accumulation, not for transfer of volatiles. So why does that matter? <clears throat> you see, an object, you, you want to form Earth, an object from here is not like that an object from here is going to go jump over there immediately and, uh, and contribute to the water content of Earth. Object from here hit another one, that one hits another one, that one hits another one. This whole process for transferring volatile to the region of accretion of Earth takes tens and hundreds of millions of years. Right. You have to take that into account. Why? Because during that uh, evolution, after, when two objects hit each other at this region, when two objects hit each other and one of them passes is volatile to another one, there is a time until the next collision happens and during that time the, wa the water or volatile content of the second body, may, the object may lose its water, the, 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 the subject to evolution of the body. So let me explain that, what that means. This is what happens to your planetary embryos all the way back there. They constantly get hit by planetesimals, planetary bodies. Some of them remove mass, some of them produce craters, and some craters are deep and get ice out, right? And that ice gets exposed, and as it gets exposed, so um, during the orbital evolution of the body, so that's what you see here, it, uh, as it gets exposed during the orbital evolution of the body, some of the ice that comes out in craters or they get scattered out, the, the, um, they evaporate. So two bodies hit each other. This one receives water, but it takes five million years for it to, uh, to get hit by another body to transfer its ice. But during that time, it does not maintain its original ice. Some of the ice goes away. We have to take that into account. It, and it, uh, the realistic model has to take that into account. This is what I just explained, that you have an object, it hits, the volatiles expose, and that takes uh, the volatiles evaporate. And what you have at the end is not what existed at the beginning. <clears throat> okay, so um, a collision between planetesimals and embryos has to be done correctly and uh, uh, that collision has to take into account the loss of volatiles and model transfer volatiles and model the transfer of volatiles and uh, uh, you also have to model the transport of volatile from one, other, one object to another. So pay attention here. You know, you have your body gets hit here I get, I'm a uh, planetary embryo, I get hit and my water surfaces, right? It takes me 10 million years to get the next collision, but during that time, I'm not here. I have moved all the way here, right? During this motion, because I'm subject to a variety of perturbations, I may lose some of my water, right? That, that I call transport. And then the collision from one object to the other, uh, I call it transfer of volatiles. That has to be taken into account. And what this shows you here is that um, the rate of sublimation varies depending on where the object is uh, compared to uh, to sun. So sun is here. What you see is the temperature as a proxy for distance. You are farther away. Uh, the temperature is lower, and you are closer. Temperature is higher, and that tells you when. Ice is exposed in a, in a body. How that ice sublimates as the object gets closer to re, uh, closer region of the um, uh, of the disk, uh, especially during its motion. And you see that a lot of evaporation happens in this region, and this is region close to to Earth, about 240k, 260k. You have to take that into account as well. And when you take all that into account, then something very interesting happens. So I'm going to run, run this thing. So uh, then um, you have uh, an object that carries water. You have an object, uh, the same object carries uh, dirt. It also has uh, a core, say solid iron core. And these objects, uh, these bodies hit each other. And depending on the collision, uh, interesting things come out of it. What you see here 
uh, is the collision angle up here and the collision velocity and what is here is the water loss. How much water is lost during the collision? Some of the water is lost because it evaporates during the orbital evolution. Some of the water is lost during the collision because of the heat of the impact. Some of the water is lost because the object loses its material. You hit it and half of it goes away. <clears throat> this tells you that when objects hit each other, how they lose their water based on the angle of the collision in terms of degrees and the collision velocity. And you see that, uh, for, of course, as expected for um, higher collisions, uh, even with low angles, uh, you have more water loss as opposed to um, when you have um, um, oblique angles. Okay, so I'm getting close to uh, finish up. And uh, what I want to say, um, I wanted to just show you application of all these ideas to one of these models. So we took one of our models and we identified this thing that became Earth. And then we look at this dynamical history and we notice that uh, it was originally at 1.5 AU and this water mass fraction was 0.5% and it collided with 15 planetesimals and 3 planetary embryos. So we went through all this process of doing the uh, collisions right and getting the water transport and transfer and, and the water evaporation and all that. Uh, we got it right and we noticed the following. So um, he, this table is a little bit... Um, uh, critical to uh, explain. So this is the original water content and this is the angle of the collision and this is the water loss. So this table tells you that, that if you only merge bodies and don't consider collision, don't consider water loss during the collision, you will be overestimating the amount of mass and water into the final body something between 40 and 63 percent. The immediate consequence of this is that that problem, the Mars problem, is an artificial problem. It's a problem of the computer. It's not a problem of physics. It's because our, com our computational um, codes, our computational tools are limited. And because of the way that we treat collision, we cannot get it right. It is not because there is a Mars problem. So when collisions treated, this is my conclusion, when collisions treated correctly, Classical model of terrestrial planet formation can form solar system analogs, including Mars. We have to do the collisions right. So we are not dealing, we are not making, developing theories, and we are not developing problems, and then try to solve that by developing new theories based on something that is artificial. Chemical composition of planets, water contents, cannot be determined post-formation. This is what a lot of people do. They bank things together, and then they go back and say, oh, where did where did the objects come from, right? This is absolutely incorrect. I've been doing that for 20 years. I'm telling you, this is absolutely incorrect. The, what, the content of chemical content, chemical composition, is the result of successive collisions. You have to do the collisions right. You cannot just say, I'm going to collide this and see where this object came, where that object came, and then I decide how much of it is from this, how much of it from that. It just doesn't work. Especially your volatiles, during their orbital evolution, you lose them. During the collision, you lose them. And they just go to space. <clears throat> so, loss of water during impact implies that at time t equals zero, the water content of planetesimal and planetary embryos were larger than traditionally considered. The, uh, the traditional consideration is based on the water contents of uh, meteorites. And that will tell you, um, consider 0% for interior to 2 AU, 2 to 2 and a half AU, consider 1%, 2 and a half AU to uh, 5 AU, um, consider say 5%. If you do that, and if you do the collisions right, you will not get the amount of water on Earth that agrees with geological evidence. You need to start with something larger than 20%, and that immediately puts constraints on the um, composition, chemical composition of the disk, the primordial disk. Observational geological and meteorite data are needed to constrain the surface density of the chemical composition of protoplanets. And that ends my, uh, ends my talk and presentation. Thank you so much.